for your participation in a little bit. So if you have your phone, make sure that you take your phone out because um, you're going to need it if you're going to participate with me. Um, and if you need the Wi-Fi password, um, the Wi-Fi is Discovery Church, and the password is just spell out Discovery with a capital D and a capital Y, and you'll get on. <clears throat> All right, so um, I never watched this show, but did anybody ever watch um, Real Housewives of and just fill in the blank? Anybody ever watch that? Is going to admit to it? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> if you don't know what the show was, it was basically a bunch of rich ladies acting like a bunch of smo spoiled rich ladies. And um, I, I never watched it. But what I discovered um, is all of these ladies who are acting like they have all of their stuff together. They've got million dollar homes and they buy crazy expensive things and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if you know this, but the majority of them, not just a few, but probably the majority of them, um, their homes went into foreclosure. Um, they filed for bankruptcy. They ended up divorced. Like their, their life was just a mess. And in what we're talking about today, we're talking about the mess that we have when we try to earn somebody's approval. Okay, now I don't know if anybody else plays this game, but I know I've walked into a few places and been like, hmm, um, I really want to impress this crowd. Okay, as a matter of fact, like there are some Sundays I get up here and I go, you know what, I am going to feel really insecure about myself if I don't do a really good job and you guys say, good job, Jace. Um, so I, I suffer from the same disease that many of you guys do. Maybe you don't even recognize it. And I'm just going to admit something. Here, here's what happens when we try and impress people and how we can get into a mess. Um, I'm a Notre Dame fan. And uh, you can like it or not. It doesn't matter to me. Um, and uh, for those of you who like UNC, congratulations. For those of you who like Duke, at least you won the first one. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Notre Dame... They've been struggling in football for a while, and uh, I don't even know. It was probably back in the 90s or something like this, but they went to hire some guy. His name was George O'Leary, which is perfect. You know, you get an Irishman, O'Leary, who's going to be the coach of Notre Dame, and, uh, and they hired him, and he was there for a grand total of five days because he had started, when he started coaching, and he, he came from Georgia Tech. So he'd been coaching at Georgia Tech, and he was doing a really good job. He had like a, you know, almost a 700 record. Um, you know, so he basically won 70% of his games. So he was doing well. Um, but back way early in the process, he wanted to impress somebody to get a job. And so he said he played football at this New Hampshire college. And he started, and he, you know, earned a varsity letter. And then, uh, I don't know if it was the same job, or a little while later, he wanted to teach not in high school, he wanted to move into the college ranks, and so he added to his resume a master's degree from said college. But he never played, and he never earned a master's degree, and so as he's moving along in his career, he just keeps it on there because, I mean, you can't take it off. You, you've, you've earned this, you know, you've played football, and you've got a master's degree, and well, all told, Notre Dame actually did their research and uh, came across this fact and this poor guy, after five days of landing, you know, the penultimate job, had to retire because he was addicted to the approval of other people and defining success as something that yeah, it, really, it really wasn't because he lied. Um, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take out your phone. And if you're following along in Uversion, Uversion is a, an app that you can use on your phone to follow along with the entire sermon. If you're following along, there's a link in there. Um, if not, we're going to take a little quiz, okay? It's three simple questions. Take out your phone. If you go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com, and, and allow your um, location to be found, you won't even have to enter the numbers. It, it should just find you. You say, hey, I want to you know, look for a, a local quiz. And there's three questions here that I want you to answer. Question number one is, how often do you try to impress people? And you've got some options, and you can answer that. <clears throat> um, question number two is, how often have you lied to impress people? Now here's, just so you know, you can be honest, 
because there is no way for me to know who answered these questions, okay? It's an anonymous poll, okay? So it's not like it's tied to your phone number and I'm going to go, oh, this one lied, we need to follow up with that. It's not going to happen. And then the last question is, how would you define success, okay? So go to Menti, enter in that code, or just turn on your location and answer these questions. I'll give you a couple seconds to do it, and then I'm going to tell you what you guys came up with, okay? And uh, one other thing, while you're doing that, um, while people are voting, um, there were note sheets, there were connection cards, stuff that were on the seats there, but I realized um, nobody has any pens. So if you need a pen, um, we can easily get you one. Um, they're in the back here, and if you'll just raise your hand, I've got some handsome dudes who will just hand you a pen. Uh, you already did it. Okay, I'm late. It's happened. It's happened. Well, good job. Thanks, uh, other handsome men. And women, and women who did it. Yes, handsome women. That's kind of scary. Um, <clears throat> all right, so here's what I'm seeing, just some uh, answers as they're rolling in. How would you, oops, I don't want to start with that one. I want to start with your polling answers. All right. Whew. How often do you try to impress people? Thank you, whoever just entered that one. Um, there are two of you who never try to impress people. You just don't care. Okay? There are 22 of you who occasionally, um, eight of you usually, and one of you is honest and say you try to impress people all the time. Um, <clears throat> so the, the bulk of us would admit that we occasionally, at some times occasionally, we try to impress people. Okay, so the second question was this. How often have you lied to impress someone else? Now, there are some of you who said never. Um, there are some of you who say more than I'd like to admit. But the vast majority of you say maybe a couple times I've lied. Nobody says sometimes it's necessary. Nobody said whenever I feel like it. So just kind of so you know what group you're in, um, the vast majority said maybe a couple times I've lied to impress somebody else. And then here I'm just going to read some of your uh, definitions of success. Um, one would define success as peace. Somebody says, keeping true to yourself and what you believe in success is not a popularity contest. Um, actually, I guess that's two sentences. <clears throat> uh, success is a positive influence on another. Success is achieving personal goals, having a good job and a family, um, reaching a goal you set for yourself, doing the best that you possibly can, achieving your goals and going beyond what you thought you could do. Um, success is self-sustaining and being happy. Um, it's contentment. It's, oh, you guys did a good job. There's a lot of answers here. Um, it's excelling beyond expectation in whatever you're doing. Uh, achieving goals. There's a lot of those. Um, success is happiness and being content. I'll read you a few more since there's a bunch of them here. Um, success. None. I do believe nothing good has ever come from it. Only temporary approval, which I later felt the need to tell the truth. Okay? Um, success is accomplishing the goals. Ooh, I like this one. Success is when my wife calls me a good man. Um, success is feeling comfortable with your achievements. Responding like Christ in life. There's, there's a lot of answers. So, but, but I also notice that there's a lot that doesn't necessarily... We don't have a, an agreed upon version of what success is. So here's, here's what we're going to start with. I'm going to... Start with this premise. We're going to go into Matthew chapter 25 because I think Jesus talked about this. And um, I'm going to start with this premise that there are two lies that are very popular in American culture. Lie number one, and there's no place for you to write this down, but you're welcome to, okay? It's not a blank to fill in. It's just something that I'm starting with. Lie number one is this. If you work hard enough, you can be anything you want to be. If you work hard enough, you can be anything you want to be. And I think that's one of our lies. Um, I think another one of our popular cultural lies is this. You can be the best in the world. And we, we teach this. We tell this to our kids. Uh, we tell it to other people when they're going to apply for jobs or they're going off to school and they're trying to figure stuff out. You can be the best in the world. You can be anything that you want to be. Here's the problem with that. The problem with that is it's the wrong definition of success because it makes us 
the ultimate authority. You can be anything that you want to be. You can be the best. And what happens is we've actually just removed God and we don't even need Him anymore. We've just become our own God. And so if you're one of those people that believes this and you're trying to be the best, you want the best family, and so you do everything you can to make sure that your family is perfect because you know you can do it. You're at, you're at risk of idolatry right there because you've just put yourself above God. You think that you can be the best person at your job ever, the most successful ever in anything. Okay, That's fine to think that, but it's a dangerous thing to think too because as we're going to see, you've just taken over the place of God. And you get to decide who's more important and who's not. And so we don't, we don't want to be in that place. And so one of, one of our values that we have here at Discovery is um, being teachable and accountable. And it's hard to do that because a lot of times we don't want to learn something because especially when we think we know it. And uh, if somebody teaches us something, we definitely don't want to be held accountable to it, especially if we don't like it. Okay, And this is one of those things where we're talking about, I want other people's approval. It's very hard to hear somebody say, it's not about your approval numbers. Okay, and, and we look at the president and we know where his approval numbers are, but ultimately the president, whether it's Trump or Obama, or who, who cares? His approval numbers, that's not what matters most in the grand scheme of things. We might think it does, he might think it does, but they're, they're totally missing the point because it makes, if he can control his approval numbers, it makes him God. Okay, so we, we want to be very careful with this. So, what is success? Okay, this is one of your blanks. You can fill this in. This is a definition that we're going to um, work with because we want to know how do we earn approval? Um, what happens if we fail and don't reach the top? Okay, you want to be top in your class. I know I talk with students all the time. And, uh, and there's some that are bitter because they came in third in their class or they came in second. I talked to somebody not too long ago and uh, they had to go out to the fifth decimal point to determine who was the class valedictorian. It, it was that close. And, and the person I was talking to came in second. So they weren't exactly happy. They felt like a, you know, a failure. And they were a little bit bitter and angry at this other person. They felt like they did not succeed. What, what do we do? Okay, Here's what success is. At least the definition that we're going to work with today. Um, success and approval. These are things to steward... They are not something to achieve. Now let me explain this to you, okay? Because this only applies if you are a follower of Jesus. And here's why. Because if, as a follower of Jesus, you have already been deemed successful. As a follower of Jesus, you have already been invited by Jesus into the family of God, and so you've already been given all the approval that you need. Okay, but if you are not a follower of Jesus, you're going to strive to achieve success. You're going to strive for approval, but that's not really what success is. Success is something that we steward. It's something that has already been given to us. And if you are a believer, this has already been given to you. So if, if you want to be successful, if you want to find approval, the best place isn't among your peers or your workplace or your family or anything like that. You don't have to you know, make your daddy proud or you know, show mama that you can do it on your own or prove that teacher who said you couldn't or that coach who said you couldn't. You don't have to prove that to him. You come to Jesus and he says, yeah, you, <laughs> I approve. That's why I want you to be part of my family. And now you will conquer death. So that makes you pretty successful. So success is something that we steward. It's something that we who are believers are given. It's not something that we have to go out and achieve, but it's a, it's a trap that we all have a pretty easy time falling into. So how do we get out of the mess when we try to earn the approval of others and we try to put up this facade and make sure that nobody knows what's going on in our house, we just put on the smiley face. Um, when we make sure nobody knows what our finances look like, we talked about that last week, we just, you know, charge it. What do we do? If you got your Bibles, I'm going to tell you a story and then we're going to kind of dig into it. But in uh, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells, uh, he tells a few parables, some stories. And so in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, he tells this story. And I'm just going to kind of summarize the story, and then we'll dig into the verses. Okay? But basically, here's what happens. There's a, a man who is going on a journey, and he calls three servants of his uh, over, and he, and he says, hey, I'm going to be gone. 
I want you guys to take care of my stuff. And so, uh, you know, let's do, we'll just say Tom, Dick, and Harry. So to Tom, he gives, uh, you know, $5,000. We'll just make it up. To Dick, he gives $3,000. And to Harry, he gives 1000 bucks. Okay? He says, I, I need to take care of it because I'm going to be gone and I can't take care of it. And so off he goes. Well, Tom goes out there with his five grand and he immediately does some work and turns it into 10 grand. He's like, man, dude's going to be proud when he gets back. And uh, Dick goes out there and he turns his three grand into six grand. Okay, good job. Um, but Harry is a little bit afraid. And so Harry's like, I'm not sure what's going to happen if I lose this. And so he just puts his thousand bucks in a drawer and uh, waits for the master to come back. And the master comes back and he talks to these guys. He's like, okay, what's going on? And one guy says, hey, I doubled your money. He's like, good, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've done well with five, I'll give you ten. Same thing with the other guy. But then the hairy guy shows up. And he hasn't done anything. And he says, hey, look, I know that you're a really rough master and you're not really, you just like to collect stuff that you haven't even worked for. Um, so here's your money. I protected it. And the master's ticked. The master's ticked because he didn't do anything, and he calls him a wicked and slothful or a wicked and lazy servant. The least you could have done is put it on deposit in the bank, and you could have earned a little bit of money. He says, um, take what this guy has and give it to the other guy. And he basically says that to whoever, and this is verse 29 if you're looking, to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And then cast this worthless servant into the outer darkness in the place that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Like, okay, think about this for a second. Think, just think about this for a second. First of all, the story isn't about money. Okay? Because remember last week we talked about money, and money is just the tool. It's not the product. Um, so this isn't a story about money. It's just a story that uses money to illustrate something. What this story is about is actually it's about faithfulness because faithfulness in what you've been given is what would be considered success. Success is something that you steward. It's not something that you achieve. And so faithfulness is how well you handle what you've been given. Okay? So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at five things that I think we can learn about the kingdom of God from Jesus in this story, because what he's talking about is a different kind of success. It's a different kind of place. It's a different kind of economy, a different kind of way that we can live. And some of us were so caught up in what people think. Some of you stood and looked at the mirror and made sure that your makeup was on, and some of you have missed church in the past because you didn't know um, what, if it was appropriate to, to wear this or that, or what somebody would say, or um, maybe things weren't in the right, you just weren't in the mood, or whatever it is, and you're just worried about other people or that it wouldn't look right. We can get past that because the kingdom of God isn't like that. So look at verse 14. Here's exactly what it says. For it, and it is talking about the kingdom of God. This is the, the story that Jesus is telling. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. Now, I don't know what you see in there. But I'm going to read it to you again and see if you can notice what's different just in, in the way that we think about it. For it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. Here's, here's something we can learn about success. God provides everything that is needed to accomplish his will or his call. Look at what it says. This man is going on a journey calls his servants, and entrusted to them his property. Okay, these guys didn't have anything, and suddenly they have something that they're supposed to do something with. So let me break it down. Maybe here's something that you can relate to. Babysitting. Now, can you successfully babysit no baby? No. Like if I, when I've told you this before. When I was a, a student pastor, I used to tell my students, you know, and this is a tip for you guys too. It's one of those honesty things. If people hear you be honest, then at least we can be 
straight up on our expectations. I'd stand in front, I'd talk to the students, and they'd say, oh, I love your kids, I'd love to babysit sometime. I said, that'd be great, you can babysit anytime you want, but I don't pay. I had family around, and I didn't, you know, okay, I'd call in favors. Say, well, that's fine, I'll do it anyway. And so these kids are volunteering to watch our kids, and they're not going to get paid. But what would happen if they came over to my house, and I said, okay, we're going out, and by we, I just took my babies with me, and we went out to dinner, and they stayed at the house, and then we came back, and I asked them, how did it go with the kids? They'd look at me like I was goofy, because I didn't leave any of the kids with them. If you want to babysit, you need a baby. If you want to be faithful in stewarding what God has given, you need to recognize that you've been given something. And so when it comes to success, and it comes to approval, you already have what you need. And most of us don't think that way. We think we need more money. We think we need a better job. We think we need um, more influence, and people would like us a little bit better. Maybe they'll be impressed with um, our accomplishments. You already have everything that you need to accomplish God's call. And I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to kind of zip through these things. I'm not, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time trying to explain them. Um, because I'll, I just want to get to the end where you guys can think about, okay, am I really kind of addicted to approval? Do I really care that much about what other people think? And I think the answer is most of us do. So <clears throat> everything that you need to be successful has already been given to you by God. So look at verse 15. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability, and then he went away. Does anybody know how much a talent is? Days wait. That was a denarius. That's a good guess, though. Yeah. Uh, probably even more than that. I, the honest answer is we don't really know because a talent wasn't necessarily an amount of money. It was a weight. Okay? And a talent, depending on which version they used, basically a talent was um, about 50 to 80 pounds of some kind of money. So 50 to 80 pounds of silver or gold in a talent. Okay? So let's just assume you got 80 pounds as a talent. And it's 80 pounds of gold, okay? You guys can kind of figure out what the market rate is, 80 pounds of gold. Like, I mean, that's a lot of money, right? Okay, now imagine five times that. Or 400 pounds of gold. The master's going away. He's like, hey, you know, here's 400 pounds of gold. Uh, that's a lot of money. Okay, so we're not talking just a, a little bit. We're talking these guys, the second they show up at the master's house and he hands them five talents, two talents, one talent, they become multi-millionaires. Okay? So kind of a big deal. But what we need to notice is something that's a little bit against our, our culture and how we think. To one he gave five, to another he gave two, to another one. And then if you got your regular Bible, you might want to underline this. To each according to his ability. Now, if you, uh, if you have a kid or have had a kid who's participated in anything in the last 10 years, you know that you go off to a tournament or something like this. You go to do some sports, and um, what happens when it's over? Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets an award because everybody's a winner, and we don't want anybody to lose. And, and in some schools, they don't even give grades anymore because we wouldn't want somebody to feel bad about it. Well, guess what? That's a ridiculous idea and it doesn't even line up with the kingdom of God. And so if you think you're doing somebody a favor by saying everybody's equal, you're wrong because here's what we see from this. We are not all equal. And that's okay. Now, let me clarify before you go off. Okay. And by the way, if you've got your note sheet, but you also have your connection card, if I say something that you disagree with or something like that, you can write it on the back of your connection card. I'll do my best to address it and answer it as clearly as I can. And there's also a link in version. If you've got a question you want to ask it anonymously, even though I don't turn the cards over, I, 
I try my best to do that anonymously. You can ask there, say, hey, I don't believe you, this is whatever. But let me just clarify something when I say we are not all equal. Okay, because that goes totally against America, right? All men are created equal. And I'm saying we are not all equal. Well, according to Jesus and the story he's telling, we're not all equal. And it's okay because the master in this story is actually kind of like God. And he's giving one guy five and one guy two and one guy one according to their ability. So here's what I mean by not equal. I do not mean how valuable you are. We are all equally valuable. However, we are not equally useful. Okay? And this is, this, it's hard for us to put our minds around. But when we're out there trying to figure out how we can earn somebody's approval, and we try to do things, okay? Any of you who had a little, a little child, you've been around a kid, and they say, me do it. Okay, you're cooking, and your kid goes, me do it. Okay, yeah, you know, we're all equal, you cook. Probably not a good idea. You're cleaning up around the house, you know, me do it. Okay, yeah, we're all equal, you do it. I wouldn't eat off those plates. See, we understand this. That doesn't mean the kid's less valuable. So let me just give you a story, okay? We're equally valuable, but we're not equally useful. And it's because we have different abilities. And so um, <clears throat> most New Year's, uh, we would invite people from church. Anybody who didn't have a place to go already, they can come over to my house, and we'd just hang out, and we'd play games, and we'd eat food, and we just, you know, whatever. And, uh, and so we did that. And this was a number of years ago. And it's winding down, and the ball drops, and um, uh, there's maybe a dozen people that are left at my house, okay? So it's after midnight. And um, I don't know how this happened, but I guess with so many people in and out, and it was kind of cold out, a mouse got in my house. Do you, do you remember this, Tyler, or were you in bed? He remembers it, okay? So there's a mouse in my house, and there's 12 people who are all equally valuable, but not all equally useful, okay? Because immediately you know where the women are. Because you can hear them, and they're running, yes. And they're on top of something, except for one girl. Like, I don't know what her deal was, but she was, like, down, looking under the stuff. I mean, she had her, literally, if the mouse would have run out from under that table, it would have run right into her eye. And she, it's like, she didn't care. She's like, I'm going to get this mouse. So what did we do? Well, we set it up so that there was no place for the mouse to escape because the useful people stayed in the room, and the unuseful people, who each according to their ability had none, went somewhere else. Okay, and just use their camera or something ridiculous like that. And so we just lined it up and, you know, somebody has the bucket and somebody has a broom and somebody, you know, we need to get the mouse. Because, of course, and obviously somebody who was really special, they put on like an oven mitt, you know, could just in case you could grab the mouse with an oven mitt because that's really effective, but thanks for playing. And long story short, we who were able caught the mouse. Now, my wife was trying to go to bed, and it was after 1 in the morning before that happened, but we caught the mouse. Does that mean that the people who stood on the side or stood on the chair or stood on the, you know, like up the stairs so that the mouse couldn't get them, that, does, does that mean that they aren't valuable? No, it just means that they weren't useful. It di they didn't have the ability to do what needed to be done right there in the same way that um, if your family gets together and you need to solve some kind of problem, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm not calling my daughter out to do certain things that I would call my son out to help me with. It's just the way it is. Corey, you, you would not hire just anybody to pump sewage, would you? Uh-uh, why? Because it's already a job, and you don't need more all over, right? Yeah, it's, it's just the way it goes. So if we understand this in the real world, why don't we understand that it's kind of like this when it comes to seeking the approval and, and being labeled a success by other people? Not everybody is equal. We are given and tasked each according to our ability. And if you look up, I didn't put it in your notes, but you can just write it down and go read it later. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about that. It talks about how we've been given different gifts in the church and some people can do this and some people can do that. So let me, let me just say, look, the gift of healings is not the same as the gift of tongues, okay? 
And that's fine, and we, we can have a whole conversation about spiritual gifts, because that might just freak some of you out. You know, you can heal people. You think you can heal people, or you speak in another language? That, that's just a little too weird, okay? Um, the, the gift of wisdom is not the same as the gift of miracles. Maybe for some people, wisdom is a miracle. But then it goes on, and it says about different spots in the church, okay? And it talks about the church being a body, and... You know, can the hand say to the foot, I don't need you, okay? Look, if you're going to play soccer and you use these things, you're not equal. As a matter of fact, you're a horrible soccer player unless you're a goalie. And you're not useful and I'm not picking you for my team. Because soccer uses your feet. Okay, you, you guys understand this? And so, and as Jesus is telling this story, God gives us everything we need to be successful. Everything that we need in order to have approval, at the same time, we are not all equal. And that's okay. So here's some good news for you. When it comes to the gospel, those who have accepted that God loves you the way that you are and he will make you an approved person because of what he's done, not because of what you've done. He will make you successful because of what he's done, not because of something that you've done. When, when we realize this, we are approved by God. <clears throat> and so, do we have to compare ourselves to others? No, we don't have to do that anymore. Why? Well, because in God's economy, in the kingdom of God, we are equal. But down here, we're not equal. When it comes to success, we are equally valuable. We're just not equally useful. So, what did these guys do when they got their stuff? Okay? Okay. Go on to the next few verses. The one who received five talents went at once and traded them, and he made five talents more. The one who had two talents made two talents more. But the one who received the one talent went and dug in the ground, and he hid his master's money. Okay. So the five made five. The guy with a few made a few more. The guy with one hid his. But note what it says, okay? Verse 18. He who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. You just write this down. If you're seeking approval, if you're trying to be successful, you need to understand that you're only going to find it when you believe like this, that we work for the master, we don't just work for ourselves. And I know for a long time, my, my wife's in the other room, so I can tell a story about her. <clears throat> and you guys won't say anything, will you? Because we're friends. Okay. So, um, for the longest time, my wife, like many women I've discovered, has struggled with the comparison game. You know, we, we homeschooled. We have five kids. I'm a pastor. And so, we just kind of compare and say, okay, well, my church is only this big, but the people who own this building, it's Ignite Church, and, I mean, they have this many people working sound. What up with that? I must be a failure. My wife, as we would go out and try and figure out how are we going to teach our kids in homeschool, and we'd go to a homeschool convention, and literally it was the worst thing in the world we could do because you would learn so much about what you could have done that you'd start thinking, I don't do anything, I must be a horrible mother. And if you're trying to win the approval of other people and, and play the comparison game in a hall with all kinds of superstar homeschool parents, yeah, you're probably a failure. But are you faithful? And so what we've discovered, and she's better at now, so she probably wouldn't even be upset if I told this story. She doesn't live in that world anymore. She recognizes, I, I work for the master. I don't work just for myself. I don't work to impress the people that are around me. I do what I do because God has called me to do it and because God has given me everything that I need in order to be successful and everybody's not equal. And so this is just how it is at my house. So my house does not look like my mom's house. It is not as clean. You can find, you, you can't just find dirt. You can find all kinds of stuff that's well beyond dirt in my house. That's okay. It doesn't mean that my wife or myself are failing. Now, to some of you it might, but that's because you're playing the comparison game and you're trying to measure up to yourself. We're not trying to measure up to the master. The master says, are you faithful with what you've got? And I think the way that we use our time and our energy and our influence and our home, the answer to that is yes. 
because I don't answer to you, and you don't answer to me. There's something freeing about that. So you want to be successful? You want other people to approve of you and honor you and think highly of you? Good. <laughs> then work for the master. Do something with what he's already given you. Let me just put it this way. Those of you who have a job, given a choice between impressing your coworkers and your boss, who would be the wiser choice? <laughs> customers, okay, smarty. Because if you impress the customers, you would impress who? Your boss. Your boss. You get approval from your boss. That's, that's what you want. Okay, so it, again, we understand this. So two guys did it well. One guy, not so well. So what's the master got to say with them or say to them? Let's look at the, the first couple guys. They get it right, okay? These are the good news guys, starting in verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants, he came and he settled accounts with them. And the one who had received five talents came forward and he brought five talents more. So the dude who had 400 pounds of silver or gold now has 800 pounds of silver or gold, okay? So he's hooked it up to a wagon and he is hauling it back. And he gives it to his master. And he says, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I've made five talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Okay, you've been faithful with what I gave you. Even though I gave you more than somebody else, but you were faithful. Enter into the joy of your master. Then, the one who had two talents came. And the master and he said, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I've made two talents more. His master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Rock on. These guys, these guys hit it out of the park. Do you know what Jesus didn't say or the master didn't say? He said, You did a better job because you had more. He didn't say that. He said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little. Now you'll be given much. Basically, God rewards faithfulness. God considers success. How faithful are you with what he has already given? So we need to look at this. I, I, I kind of hesitate putting it this way, but let me explain it. Success is a product of work, okay? There is something that we have to do. However, what happens, because this is a question people ask, what happens if you studied as hard as you could for that test and you still failed? Or you, you parented those kids as well as you could, but they're still just little hellions running around town. What happens then? You did the best you could with what you had. What, what happens then? What happens if you're at a job and you're on a, a work plan and if you don't fix things, you're going to get fired. And so you do everything you can to do what the boss has asked you to do and you put forth your best effort and you still get fired. What happens if you tried to really love your wife? Or as, as a wife, you tried to respect your husband and they still left you? What, what do you do then? Because now your marriage failed. It, this, this failed. And if success is a product of work and you put in the work, how come you're not successful? If that's the question you're asking, it's because you're looking at outcomes. But remember, success isn't an achievement. It's how you steward what you've been given. And so if you're a husband who's loved his wife and your wife still went off and did whatever she did and she left you, were you faithful to what God has equipped you with and called you to? If the answer to that is yes, you're successful. That's the product of work. And God will say, you've been faithful with little, I will give you much. How do I know this? Because it's happened in my life. Some of you have heard this. There was a time in my wife, in my wife, in my life where my wife um, really didn't like me. I was a jerk. And I've told you before, because I still remember, it's a, it's a watershed moment in our, in our marriage and in my life where she looked at me and she said, I would rather be single for the rest of my life than be married to you any longer. Now, why would she say I would rather be single? Because she knows what the Bible has to say and who her master is that she works for. And um, there were no legal grounds for divorce. I was just a butt. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be married to a butt. 
And she didn't want to be married to a butt, but she was willing to be faithful in the situation that she was in. Not just to me, but to God. And God would count that as success, even if I wouldn't have changed. So some of you guys are sitting there and you're thinking, I'm a failure because things didn't work out the way I planned. Because um, my kids are messed up, my marriage is messed up, I've filed bankruptcy, I don't have the job I wanted, I've, I've had DWIs, I'm addicted to this, uh, people look at me like I, I can't accomplish anything. Whatever your deal is, guys, it's not true. Success is a product of work, but the work that we're talking about is the work of being faithful. It's as simple as that. We were made for work. From the very beginning, God made man, He made Adam and Eve, He put them in the garden, He said, work. Take care of it. Be fruitful. Multiply. Do something. But you can't be fruitful if you're not faithful. Okay, so we, we understand. Him. I'm not here to beat you up if you're the one who wants people to look at you like a success. I'm here to tell you you already are if you will just understand that Jesus calls you to something that He's already called you. He calls you to success because He calls you a success. So faithfulness might also mean doing something that others think is wrong or stupid. Okay, More than a few people that have come through Discovery, whether they're here now or they've been here before, have been in marital difficulty. And the spouse has decided to stay and love their spouse in spite of their sin. Why? Because they're trying to be faithful. And other people have said, I can't believe that you're staying with him or I can't believe that you're going to stay with her after he or she did that. And other people look at you like you're an absolute idiot. You don't have their approval. You're a failure. I would have left. But you stay because you know who your master is. Like I, I just want to encourage those of you, we serve somebody other than ourselves. And success, yes, it's a product of work, but it doesn't mean that it's easy work and it doesn't mean that it's work other people are going to approve of. I'll give you an example from my life. I worked at a church in Florida. I was a youth pastor. I was there for eight years. And uh, we had this pastor. His name was Pastor Chuck. And uh, he was a great guy. He was kind of funny um, and kind of funny in an awkward kind of way too. So it was like he was funny, but you also wanted to laugh at him. You know, that kind of guy. Um, but he'd been hurt and things had gone on in the church before and where it had split and this and that. And so he was kind of controlling and didn't really want to listen to a whole lot. Um, and so they'd have big events and, uh, you know, like a Thanksgiving thing and you'd invite your friends to, that's what it was for, and uh, a Christmas thing or whatever, you invite your friends to. And Pastor Chuck would get up there and he would talk and he would share stories or whatever, but sometimes, because it wasn't scripted and he didn't know what he was saying, he would say something absolutely insulting. Like, I remember one time I had invited somebody, I'd been friends with him for a while, and we invited him to like a Thanksgiving dinner or something like this. And Pastor Chuck gets up there and he starts talking, and he starts talking about Catholics, and then he starts talking about how wrong Catholics are. And then he starts making fun of Catholics. I'm like, what are you doing? But he's got the microphone, and I'm sitting here with my friend who I've been friends with for a little while who's Catholic. And so, fast forward. We had numerous conversations at staff meetings and stuff. And I, I basically, I told Pastor Chuck, I said, I'm, I will invite people to church, but I'm not inviting them to these special events because it takes me years to form relationships with them. And then I get here, and you act like an idiot and insult them. And then all you have to say is, I'm sorry, and I have to spend the next four or five years trying to build up their trust again. And it's not even trust to bring them back here, because I don't trust you. So no, I'm not going to invite people to stuff like this. And that frustrated him. You know, here's a staff member who's not inviting people. To, I said, if you can tell me that you won't say anything that's like... Write out what you're writing, Stick because it's happened numerous times. He wouldn't do it. So one day, it's Tuesday morning, he calls me into his office, it's like 8.45, and I don't know if he had a bad night or what, and he's like, I just need to know, are you going to, and he asked a couple questions, he says, and are you going to invite people to this church? And I'm thinking to myself, it's only 8.45, I'm going to go back home and say, honey, I got fired. I, ha I had a choice to make. Am I going to be faithful to not him, not me, not just my friends? but trying to point people to Jesus. And this didn't look like the way that you would do that when you don't bring some... Jesus didn't make fun of people. <laughs> and I had to decide. And I just, no, I'm not. I can't. 
And I explained the whole thing again, not just not in a rebellious, arrogant way or anything. I'm just like, I really wish I could, but I can't. And here's why. But I will be happy to invite people if, and here's what needs to happen. And I'm thinking, that's it. You know, you've been here for seven years. You're going to get the boot. And uh, he just looked at me and said, okay, you want to lead worship again? But look, it's not easy. You don't even know how it's going to turn out. I could have just as easily been fired, and guess what? I wouldn't have changed my mind. My wife could have just as easily stuck around with me, and I could have still been a butt. But she would have been considered successful because success is a product of work, and work is what we call faithfulness. Okay? So what about the bad guy? Here's the bad guy. Get to the end. Bad guy. Uh, let's see, verse 24. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you were a hard man. You reap where you don't sow, you gather where you don't scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what's yours. But the master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I scattered no seed, and then you ought to have invested my money with bankers and at my coming should have received what was mine with interest. So, take that talent away from him, give it to the one who has ten. Everyone who has, more will be given. But the one who has not, even that will be taken away from him. Cast him into the place where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A couple things that we can learn. First of all, notice what this guy did. This guy blamed the master. He basically blamed and complained about the guy who gave him a talent and trusted him and said, hey, I think you have the ability to do something. He says, no, I don't have the ability because you're mean. And so the master is not exactly happy about that. And he says, he basically calls him wicked <clears throat> and lazy. And I don't know if you know this, but I looked up that word for slothful or for lazy. And I thought it was interesting because it's actually a word. It doesn't just mean lazy. It's almost like um, procrastinate. Uh, hesitate, like I'm not going, any of you who have ever driven with somebody who's learning to drive and they're, they're trying to figure out, should I go, should, should, should I go, because there's traffic coming and they don't know if they can pull out, and it, it, it's that, okay, and they just don't ever move. That's, that's the kind of lazy that he's talking about. If, it's like being paralyzed with hesitation. You wicked, lazy, slothful, paralyzed by hesitation servant. Basically, what it boils down to is the servant was afraid. And so here's, here's the question. Are you afraid of what other people think? Because I'm going to tell you what we can learn from this in a second. But are you afraid what other people think? If you did this, if you didn't attend that event, but everybody kind of expects you to, would you feel like they look down on you? If your kids and you're in a restaurant or you're here at church and one of them's making noise, are you immediately going to shush them because you're embarrassed by them? Because other people might look at you like, oh, I can't believe... Their kid did that. I know some of you feel that way because I've seen you do it. Are, are you afraid of failing? Like, we have people that come up here. Um, Dave has sung before. Dave plays uh, bass. I'm not just picking on you. I'm just saying there's, there's a guy here who I know that it, he is not comfortable. This is not, he, he likes doing it, but he doesn't like doing all of it. Dave's preached before. David probably punched me before he preaches again. <laughs> and both will happen. Thanks, Ralph. I appreciate that, looking out for me. Um, but there are people of you out here, you have a voice and you could sing, but you won't because you're afraid, and you're afraid of what other people will think if you try. There are people out here who have abilities and you could actually teach somebody something, but you're afraid of actually trying to disciple somebody because you're afraid of what somebody's going to say about you. Like, who's that guy to disciple somebody? Who's that guy to try and teach somebody about this, that, or the other? And you don't want to have the murmurings. Even if you've never heard them, you just make them up in your own mind. And you're afraid of the voices in your head now. Some of you are afraid to go and get another job. You're afraid to go and try to go back to school. You're afraid to say, I'm sorry to somebody and seek forgiveness. 
you're afraid to say, I'm not sorry, this really is how I feel, and I wish you would be different. Because you're afraid of what the response is going to be. Guess what? The question there is, but are you being faithful with what you've been given? If you can sing, you need to be singing. I'm just picking on easy stuff. If you have an ability to do something, you need to be using that ability. So here's, here's what the guy was picked on for. The lesson that we need to learn from this. <clears throat> if we're going to overcome an approval addiction and this idea that we need to be successful, we need to just embrace risk and not avoid it. Okay? In other words, fail with flair. Seriously. Do not just your best, but the best that you can do. Because it's according to your ability. And there are some people, you can sing. Not as good as somebody else, but that's okay because not everybody's equal. But you should probably still sing. And there are some of you who you're really good at this, that, or that. You should do it. Stop being afraid of it. So, do you know why the man was punished? At the end of the day, he was punished for not trying. Okay? Do not waste your life seeking the approval of other people and trying to accomplish something that matters not and not try to do something with what God has already given you. Some of you are afraid to pray out loud. Oh, what is somebody going to think? I don't have the right words. I don't know how to use those words. I don't even know what that word means. Get over it. Fail with flair. Some of you think that you can't memorize Scripture, and so, if, you know, somebody wants to say, hey, we should memorize this verse. You're not going to try it because you're just afraid that you're going to fail. Get over it. Fail with flair. Make up your own words. Sooner or later, you'll figure it out. Okay? Because we value teachable and accountable, and if you get it wrong, we'll say, no, nope, that's wrong. Some of you are afraid to be honest. You don't want anybody to know what your mess is because you're afraid that they're going to think that you're a mess. Fail with flair. My wife, I mean, I'm glad she's not here, and I haven't really told that many stories, but if you've been around Discovery for a while, you know I'm a mess. I, and, yep, I own it. Like a boss. Not because I want to stay there, but because <laughs> at least I'm trying. I don't always get it right. So guys, you're a mess. You and I, everybody here, we're a mess. Get over it. Embrace it. Own it. So what do we do? I'm just going to give you a few tips here, and then we're going to be done. I spoke longer than I was planning on. I apologize. If you have to go, you're welcome to go. At any point, you're not going to upset me. Because why? I'm not looking for your approval. <clears throat> so how do we address the mess? Okay. Remember we talked about some um, things before when, when we look at it. Um, there's an inconvenience. It's not easy to address this. It's, it's not the right time. I don't have um, the right tools in place. Okay, well, we're going to talk about that. Um, it's uncomfortable. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to admit anything. Let's deal with that. And same with being out of control. So here's a few things. If it's your mess, if you're the one who's always looking for approval and trying to be successful in other people's eyes, one of the things that you can do, it's going to be an inconvenience, but you can, you can quit. Just quit whatever it is that you're trying to prove to people that you're good at and start over. It might mean changing your job. If you're trying to be some super superstar CEO, quit. Quit. If that's really the thing that you're chasing and it's an idolatrous adventure, quit. Yeah, it's inconvenient. You might lose some money. You might have to you know, be out of work for a while. I, hey, look, you're going to have to take some drastic steps. Quit. Start over. If you're uh, going to school because you think this is what you're supposed to do because that's what your family always said, you don't have to. Quit. Start over. I don't need to get that approval. But figure out what God has gifted you with and then go do that. Another one, it's uncomfortable. Well, guess what? If you think you've got a mess, yeah, it's uncomfortable, but just admit it. Hey, look, I struggle with having people. I want people to like me, and so I'll say things sometimes, and I'll do things that I really don't want to do, but I want people to like me, and so I'll do that. And so can you just make sure, like if I ever say yes to something or whatever, will you just say, are you doing this because you have to or because you want to? Like, just admit it. Tell somebody. Ask for some help. It's not comfortable, but it's helpful. You want things to be out of control? Okay, well, here's all you have to do. You just, you aim for faithfulness. What's that mean? Okay, here's what it means. If you've been betrayed by people, so what? 
Just aim for faithfulness. Can you still be faithful? You think that, hey, anyway, I'm not going to go there. I'm just, you guys will have to figure this stuff out. What happens if you see this mess in somebody else? You see that they are always trying to strive and succeed and they're never happy unless they're the one on top and they're driven, motivated by it. If it's someone else, um, yeah, if it's someone else, uh, the inconvenient thing is going to be ask some questions, you know, to take the time to understand. Like, what is it that you're trying to prove? Just ask. Do you, do you think you have to do this? Like, do you have to be the perfect parent? Do you have to be the perfect mother? Does it have to be the perfect Christmas? Does your house have to be perfect? You're not going to have anybody over unless everything's picked up. Does it have to be that way? Just ask. But then listen. You can invite them out of it. Okay, don't tell them that they're a mess. They already know that. Just invite them out of it. And say, well, why are you asking me this? Then you can tell them. Well, because you're a mess. And I'd like you to live with a little bit of freedom. And lastly, things that are out of control. Look, this is not just a cliche, but pray for them. You see somebody who is addicted to the approval of other people, and the only reason that they do things is because it looks good for somebody else. Pray for them. Then it's not in your control. Why? It doesn't need to be. Because the good news is, God gives us everything that we need in order to be successful. Not everybody is equal. It's going to take work, but work doesn't look like just doing stuff. It's not an achievement. It's about faithfulness. And so don't avoid taking that risk. So here's the risk that I'm asking you. Okay, Here's the risk that I'm asking you to take. If you're running around looking for the approval of other people, trying to impress them, thinking that, hey, I'm smart enough. I've got to figure out this Jesus thing, and if I get all the answers in the right way, then I'll... I'll be a success when I figure it all out. You don't need to do that. God's already got it figured out. Now, it's fair to ask questions. Go for it. If you're trying to impress other people and you want everybody to like you and you're not okay when people don't or you don't want people to know your junk, you have to try and do something about it. So what I'm inviting you into is a relationship with Jesus who said, hey, look, these guys don't have it figured out, and so I'm going to come, and I'm going to let them know that there is a better way. And so Jesus came to let us know that there is a better way. And he says, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light, and come to me if you're tired. So if you're tired of playing that game, then just come to Jesus. Just admit, hey, I've, I've been playing the game, and I'm tired of it. I don't want to do this anymore. And then it's not a matter of thinking as much as it is of listening, because Jesus says, you are wanted. You are chosen. You are approved. You are successful. You are mine. Anybody who says yes to Jesus, that's what he says about you. And so I'm going to pray that we would live in that. And if you haven't started that kind of relationship, if you haven't been moving towards just letting Jesus define your success, you can start right now. There's no magic in it. Like, I don't mind altar calls when people need to make decisions and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has set you free from whatever your mess is. So we don't need to figure out that. We just need to figure out, do I, do I really believe that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection can make me better, can make me healthy, can give me the freedom that I don't have? If the answer to that is yes, then start that walk, and let's start walking and following Jesus together. Father, we pray that in Jesus' name, he would set us free from all the junk that we carry around trying to impress ourselves, impress our parents, impress our friends to earn their approval. I mean, I'm not lying, God, when I say sometimes it's hard for me. I feel like even this morning, I feel like I haven't communicated this very well and I just suck. And maybe I have, but I've done the best I can with what I've got. And so I might not be a, a five talent pastor and preacher. I'm okay with that. You've given me two. I'll use them. If I'm a one, I don't care because you haven't given me more than I'm capable of handling. I don't ask little kids to carry 200 pounds because they're incapable. But we ask people who have the ability to do what you've asked them to do. And so, Father, I'm just doing what you've asked me to do, which is sharing good news and saying Jesus is good enough for us. And so I pray, Father, for each person here that we would say yes to that but not just as a point of decision, but as a way of life.
We pray that, Father, in the name of Jesus. That isn't just a name on a page or from a book or a 2,000-year-old story, but it is Jesus who's here now and alive in so many of us and powerful to bring about the hope that we need. And we pray in his name. Amen.